All right, so the last lecture before the break. So we're going to spend some time talking about um, soft tissue injuries. Lots of stuff that we see in the ER. So we're going to start off. Um, th this, this slide talks about the difference between strains and sprains. And I'm not going to insult your intelligence by explaining that. You already know that. But the information in this slide is really valuable to share with patients. Uh, in terms of patients don't know the difference between sprains and strains and the difference between tendons and cartilage. So I think it's important for us to be able to share that information uh, with patients. This is the West Point sprain grading system and uh, shows the grades between one and three, with one obviously being the smallest with microscopic tearing, some minimal swelling, uh, no joint stability, uh, instability, and, and usually fully or even partially weight-bearing, where grade two is partial, moderately severe swelling, mild, moderate joint instability, and usually unable to, to weight-bear, and grade three the worst with complete rupture, uh, severe swelling, moderate, moderately severe instability, and unable to, to ambulate. So here's the mnemonic for taking care of closed soft tissue injuries, the PRICER, P-R-I-C-E-R, we're going to go through that. The P really talks about protecting the injury. And this often involves immobilization or crutches for a short period of time. Remember the days when we put people, we immobilized them forever. People would be in splints or casts or whatever, you know, for weeks and maybe even months at a time. And we don't do that anymore because we found out uh, that was more harmful. So, but we do need early on in any kind of an injury, protect, protect the injury. Uh, the R is to rest the involved area, but again, not for very long. Um, and so excessive immobilization may re result, particularly in the joints, with stiffness, particularly in the elderly. Um, and al also, early mobilization in the pain-free area range is strongly encouraged. We now know that p folks who have uh, orthopedic surgery, um, knee replacements are out walking this within 24 hours. So it's something that we've learned in terms of rehabilitation. The I is for ice. Um, ice is, has, we've used it forever. Um, don't put ice directly on the skin, wrap it up in a towel. You can get frozen peas, you know, it, it, that can conform to the injury. It's a good idea, you know, to get that out of the fridge. Frankly, I like, uh, you know, uh, frozen corn better. Thanks for getting that joke. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, really don't use ice for more than 30 minutes at a time. Uh, there's lots of claims out there about ice, uh, but I've always had good res results you know, with ice early on in, in injury. Um, compression. We know that compression does reduce edema. It disperses the excess tissue uh, and fluids. It, it, it aids in venous return. Just make sure that the pressure is, is greater distally than, than proximally so that we don't inadvertently uh, end up having a tourniquet. Elevation also reduces edema. So we try to elevate the injured part above the level of the heart um, and, uh, um, and that works really well. There's some discussion about whether you ought to, ought to do compression and elevation at the same time. Not everybody agrees, uh, you know, but do what's, what's right for your patient and your experience. The maximal benefits for elevation occur like it is with ice in the first 72 hours. Uh, and then R for rehabilitation. Um, some soft tissue injuries, particularly around the joints, may require rehab to limit the likelihood of permanent joint stiffness. So uh, the truth is the, the quicker we get people back ambulating uh, appropriate, in the appropriate amount of time, the better it is. Uh, this is also true with shoulder injuries, particularly in the elderly. The longer we keep somebody immobilized, uh, the, the higher the incident of stiffness and maybe lack of, of uh, mobility. <clears throat> lacerations. So, you know, how many of you are the go-to person in your ER for lacerations, for suturing? A lot of, a lot of people love, love suturing. We're going to talk a little bit about not how to suture, but some you know, tips of the trade in terms of suturing. So uh, cleaning the lacerations. Remember the day when someone would come in with a laceration and you'd plunk their arm or their hand you know, into a big, big bowl of betadine and leave them in there for about a half an hour? Um, we now find out that you really can't adequately clean a laceration without good uh, 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 anesthesia. So the sooner you get that patient uh, anesthetized, the local anesthesia in there, the better you're going to be able to, to clean that area out. So have a high priority 
as soon as the patient gets into the ER uh, to anesthetize that area. Uh, it also helps to obviously relieve pain, obviously to uh, prevent bleeding. Um, and soaking does very little to, uh, to, to, to clean out the wound. I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes about, you know, uh, pulsatile and jet cleaning, um, but we do find out that, that, that it works really well. Uh, also, in terms of betadine solution, the 10% really shouldn't be put into the wound. It does become a little toxic, so if you dilute it down to about 1%, then it's okay. Okay, wounds that are very dirty, really greasy, yucky uh, wounds. Um, obviously, if we can anesthetize the area, maybe even get them over to the sink uh, and, and, and get some good scrubbing going to clean out that area. Um, uh, pulsatile jet irrigation is really effective. Um, you only have to be, you have to be a little careful uh, the deeper you go into a wound in terms of causing some damage, uh, but for the most part, it works really well. What about, and this is really important, and probably if you remember anything in this half an hour, this is the part I want you to remember. It's really important to talk to the patient while you're taking care of the wound. And not, not only for, for them to understand what's going on, but frankly, so that, so that um, you, don't, you, you don't have to get up in front of a, uh, of a judge and explain what happened. So some of these things, I'm going to do my best to make sure you have a, as little discomfort as possible. You know, assuring the patient, you know, that you care about their pain level. I'm cleaning the wound very thoroughly. I've tried very hard to remove all the foreign material I can find, but there's always a chance some can be hiding. I'll tell you a story in a minute if I have time about that. Um, I don't see any evidence of a tendon or nerve injury, and wounds always heal with scars, but I'm going to make sure yours is as small as possible. And we could go on and list other, other things that are important, um, but talking to the patient and explaining to them what you're doing is gonna help them be educated, also the people who are with them, as well as any, any questions later on. Okay, what about the difference between um, uh, marcaine and lidocaine? Um, we do find that there's a relatively equivalence. 0.25% uh, of the marcaine is equivalent to 1% of the xylocaine. Uh, the onset of the action, um, you know, the, the xylocaine might be slightly faster, but really not significant uh, clinical significance. Uh, but we do know that marcaine uh, may decrease the need for post-procedure analgesia compared with the shorter acting light. Uh, lidocaine. And I think I have a graph in here somewhere that talks about the mechanism, a er, mechanism of action. Well, there it is. So this is a great graph. Goes through the different uh, anesthetics, the formulations, uh, the duration of action, and the maximum dosage to use uh, is right there. So valuable information to have on hand. Some other anesthetic tricks. Um, if you if you warm up the anesthetic, it's less painful when it's injected. Uh, into the skin. So consider carrying a, a bottle in your pocket. You can also consider uh, you know, alkanizing it. You know, one mil milliliter of bicarbonate at 8.4% to 10 milliliters of lidocaine. So when you inject that, it's less painful. Uh, the pH is raised to about 6.6 .6 to 7.7, .7, which really reduces the amount of burning. Works faster at the higher pH. Uh, you may have to get the pharmacy to make it and label it properly um, for, to use. Other, other things, use the smallest gauge needle possible, 27 or 30. You may have to get a special order for that and inject slowly. I don't know about you, but I remember times w when I have tried to inject and I really put a lot of pressure in it, and what happened, it, it, it's popped, the needle pops off. And that's, uh, that, that doesn't engender a lot of, of uh, support from the patient when that happens. Um, so avoid multiple needle sticks, pull back and redirect rather than repuncturing the skin. And it's also important to inject through the open wound edge rather than through the intact skin to get the anesthesia in there. If you're going, if you're going to, 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 uh, to suture lacerations of the face, make sure you're comfortable with the anatomy in, in terms of where the nerve blocks of the face are. Um, you, can, you can anesthetize large areas with minimal amounts of local anesthesia and few injections. And uh, this, uh, this graph sort of shows that, as does the next one in terms of the product duct and the facial nerve proximity. You know, a, a, a vertically oriented laceration posterior to the corner of the eye and bisecting a line drawn from the tragus of the ear to the center of the upper lip can involve both the facial nerve and the product duct. So if you're, if you're in the habit of, of suturing a lot of 
facial lacerations. It's important to know what the anatomy is and what the landmarks are. Okay, more about facial lacerations. Obviously, you've, we've heard this a hundred times. Don't shave eyebrows. Um, I actually had a student with me once and went down and uh, uh, thought that, that he would help out and actually shaved off an eyebrow. Uh, uh, the good news is it grew back, but you know, you, you always worry about that. So it's always important to tell students, please don't do that. Um, also, uh, getting a specialist for eyelid lacerations may be in order, uh, because, especially if it transects the margins because the alignment of the two sections, they need to be perfect. And uh, all, all the same thing with through and through lip lacerations. They need closure of the front and the back and the middle, so not just the front and the back. So you gotta make sure uh, that you actually have full closure of that area. Um, the vermilion border of the lip, they need perfect alignment as well. Um, and uh, eversion of the edges to, to minimize any visual scarring. What about foreign bodies? Big issue. Um, organic foreign bodies and wounds may cause infections, so they need to be found and removed if at all possible. Um, even, even types of glass, ex except maybe really tiny ones, may show up on x-ray, um, and so have a low threshold for imaging. Um, the good thing about glass is it's fairly inert, and it, over time it may, it may come out, it may skewed out, um, especially if, if it's typical, if it's shattered windshields that cause them multiple fine forehead lacerations with retained glass. So uh, but it's wise not to, to assure the patient that you've found all the foreign bodies, because uh, you may be wrong. Okay, so when a foreign body is suspected in a wound and imaging is attempted, it's important to order the correct study. So foreign bodies that, that are not typically seen on plain x-rays may be visible on ultrasonography. The picture here is kind of hard to see, you know, really looks at a toothpick in the sole of the foot. Um, actually, there's a white arrow that shows you where it is, otherwise I wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, but anyway, so ultrasound may be valuable for, for foreign bodies that you wouldn't normally see on plain x-rays. Okay, um, actually, let me tell you a, a quick story. I think I have time for it in, in terms of foreign bodies and important to talking with the patient. Um, I was an expert witness a number of years ago in a patient, a 40-year-old patient who was up on his roof cleaning out leaves from the, the gutter on top of his roof. 40-year-old um, was on 20 milligrams a day of prednisone for a rheumatoid disorder, actually tripped, fell, and as he came down the ladder, lacerated the dorsum of his foot, fell into the grass and weeds and stuff, and, and got the area very contaminated, was taken to the ER by ambulance, um, was seen in the ER promptly, both by the doc and the PA, uh, area was anesthetized. It was thoroughly examined and then irrigated with, with a, a, a pulse irrigator. Um, and, and, uh, and, and all during this time, both the PA and the, and the doc uh, were talking with the patient and the patient's family. Um, X-ray was done, area was sewed up, uh, and uh, the patient was scheduled to see an orthopedic follow-up uh, in three or four days. Um, the x-ray then came a couple of hours later, the x-ray was seen and the radiologist said, there's some possibilities of some foreign matter noted you know, on the x-ray, which is really difficult to see. Um, so what do you do? You say, well, it's, 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 it's very possible that some small particles of things are still in there. You're not gonna go back and try to find it. Unfortunately, within 48 hours, the area got really red and hot. Patient went in and saw a podiatrist who put him on an antibiotic. Two days later, went in to see an orthopedic surgeon who actually opened it up, and in their, in their um, report, said they'd found some black material matter in there. And uh, so the patient ended up having some additional surgeries. Turns out, by the way, that, that uh, the organism in this particular uh, uh, patient um, was aspergillus, and uh, uh, that was the cause of, of the, the, the bad sequelae. Nonetheless, the long story short, uh, went to court um, and, uh, and actually the, the jury found in, in favor of the defendant, uh, in, in favor of the doc and the PA. And the, th and the things that they said uh, during that was the, the information that was provided to the patient, both verbally and written, uh, as well as following the standard of care. Um, but this was a guy who went clear through a, a, a trial case because he wanted to prove a point. He was a fairly wealthy guy, but he, he, he didn't prevail. 
And the importance was uh, talking with the patient, giving them information, and never promising anything that you can't provide. Okay. Tongue lacerations, uh, closing guidelines. So consider closing tongue lacerations, obviously if they're large, anything great, large greater than one centimeter or gaping, um, especially uh, with the tongue at rest, um, or if you're gonna stop some bleeding, um, or if there's an anterior split in the tongue. So otherwise, smaller lacerations or non-gaping wounds uh, should not be sutured. Puncture wounds, very difficult. Um, and a lot of the, the practice about this is really anecdotal, not a lot of literature out there, but we do know that any kind of a puncture wound, we need, especially if it's gone through you know, a shoe or a sock you know, or some other material that's pushed, pushed uh, foreign body material in there, we need to do the best we can to, to maybe core that area and get out as much foreign body as possible, obviously under local anesthesia. Um, Early infections of these, these types of injuries uh, do occur. It's usually staph or somewhere down the road it might be pseudomonas. Um, it's usually not the standard of care to give prophylactic quinolones for, for sole of the foot puncture wounds, uh, but just to have a, 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 a high index of suspicion if you think there's a possibility of infections. Um, general wound repair tips. Um, in, term, in terms of devitalized tissue, um, Throughout the body, if you can debride as much of that tissue uh, as you can, that's going to be very valuable in the long run. Obviously, you've got to be really careful on the face. Um, close fat and dead spaces. Otherwise, if you have some open spaces underneath the, the, the area, you, you leave room for hematomas to form. Um, optimal scar requires minimal tension um, on the skin edges. Um, and that's why when we talk about which kind of suturing we're going to do, um, we, we may have to do some multi-layers to be able to do that. Um, realize that buried, absorbable sutures are considered foreign bodies and, and can actually uh, be problematic at some point. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, suturing. Sutures with tiny loops can be really difficult to remove. So how many of us have had a patient come in and a previous provider had put in such small sutures, you know, that you could hardly get them out. So be careful. Realize when you're putting sutures in that the person who's, who's going to be taking them out um, um, could be you. So um, this is especially true when crusts are formed. So, so um, make sure that, that the amount of crust is removed. Um, so if you can have the person take out the sutures who put in the suture, that would be great. That's not always the case. Um, Picture here, you see, if, if the sutures are too tight, um, they can cause some railroad track marks uh, scarring uh, when they're removed. So here's the graph on suture material, uh, the suture types, the generic structure, the classification, and the product brand name. Valuable information to have on hand in terms of ordering or knowing what kind of sutures that you want to have on hand. Let's talk about some suture types, and this really comes down to a, your comfortableness with particular suturing and the kind of wound that occurs. So the, the running subcuticular sutures um, using non-absorbable material uh, uh, is really a pretty good way of closing straight line lacerations as it's shown here in this, in this picture uh, with really not very much wound tension, which is what we want. Then you tie the, the uh, knots at both ends and then it can be reinforced uh, with tape. So uh, a very popular uh, uh, suturing mechanism. Uh, the simple and locking running suture. So, you know, so this, this really can get some good cosmetic effect. Um, uh, and, and by the way, if you, if you use the running suture and somewhere down the road, part of that wound area gets uh, uh, infected, you can actually cut part of the suture and unravel it um, and, and then the rest of the suture stays intact. So it works pretty well. Mattress sutures uh, uh, to help simultaneously close the deeper tissues uh, plus the skin. And there you see the horizontal mattress, the vertical mattress, and the running contiguous vertical mattress sutures that work really well. Um, Pre-tibial flap lacerations, particularly in the elderly, um, I'll admit there's been times when I actually I tried to pull the skin over and using small sutures to close it, it doesn't work. It's very difficult and it just tears. So the best possible way to treat these is, is using steri strip 
um, and, uh, and try to get the best result because it, it, it's, the more you try to suture this, this very skin thin, especially if you're trying to pull it over um, with too much tension, it'll just break and fall apart. Corner stitch is another one. If you had this V-shaped laceration here, it's really tempting to take your, your suture needle and go underneath and grab that tip of that, of that V and try to pull it over. Just realize again that you're causing way too much tension there, so don't do that. Um, and uh, you know, using X-shaped wounds, uh, uh, using corner stitches can actually be much better as you can see there in that second picture. Staples, thank you God, I tell you. What a great thing that happened. I used to work at Phoenix Memorial Hospital in Phoenix. If any of you remember that hospital over in South Phoenix, it used to be called the Knife and Gun Club. And I would go in and I would, I would staples for six hours on a Saturday night. And half the people didn't even need anesthesia. So uh, you get it, okay. Um, this can also be used on the trunk and the extremities um, and other places um, that, uh, that uh, uh, it's very valuable. Uh, just be careful to make sure that the wound edges are everted and of equal heights. And if you've done a lot of stapling, you get, it gets to be a pretty good art. And it's associated with fewer infections uh, than, than typically suturing. So, um, great stuff. Also, another thing from God is tissue glue. Um, you know, don't use this in high tension areas um, or any of those areas that sort of stays moist. But this is great stuff. I was working in the ER one day and a colleague of mine, another PA, called and said he was at home and uh, his 10-year-old uh, kid was out on the skateboard and flipped up and lacerated his, just above his eyebrow. And uh, so being a good PA, he got out his first aid kit and his sutures and he cleared the kitchen table and put his kid on the kitchen table and got, got it ready to, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't suture his own kid. So he called me and says, could you come over and do it? And I go, sure. So on the way out, I grabbed some tissue glue, took it over to his house, glued up that little area, you know, and there's no, that was maybe 10 years ago now, no scar today. And, uh, and his, his son sent me all kinds of thank you notes and will not let his dad touch him again. <laughs> so the, the great cosmetic effects um, with glue. Um, and usually you don't have to do wound checks, which is pretty good. Um, make sure that you stay away from antibiotic ointment or anything with petroleum uh, because it, it sometimes can dissolve the glue a little bit. Oops. Uh -oh. Okay, another little bit of controversy, uh, prophylactic wound antibiotics. Did I do? Yes, okay. So a little bit of controversy there. The practice is really variable, not a lot of data, uh, but, but you know, consider the value of antibiotics in sutured animal bites and uh, um, heavily contaminated wounds, anything where, there, where the tissue is devitalized, obviously any open fractures, especially any tough fractures, through and through mouth lacerations, hand and foot lacerations, or, or in the immunocompromised patient. Um, so you're probably not surprised when I told you that story about now that the patient who was also on prednisone ended up with aspergillus, a um, little bit of compromised uh, uh, patient going on there. <coughs> Follow-up of, suture, of sutured wounds. Um, the incident in the ED of wound infections is extremely small, about 5%. Rarely infections. The lowest is on the scalp and the face. Obviously, the highest is on the extremities for obvious reasons. Um, it's also shown that, that patients are really not very good judges of whether their wounds are infected. Um, you know, often somebody will come in and say, I think it's infected. It's really not. You've got a little erythema there, uh, but, but no pus, nothing else going on. So um, it's always a good idea to have a wound check in two to three days, just as a general rule. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. It's valuable to do that. Um, after the wound check, to minimize scarring, to facilitate suture removal, Let's make sure that we remove crusts with uh, cotton tip applicators, get a little peroxide uh, at the, at the, uh, while you're doing the daily dressing change, um, remove any crusts, then apply a little bit of ointment like polysporin to the wound surface. And if you do that, it's, it's shown to accelerate wound healing and decreases you know, future crusting. Um, also, once the area is fully healed, um, uh, you know, encourage the patient to use sunscreen you know, uh, often, and then avoid other types of creams, no proven efficacy with other types of creams like vitamin E. 
Here's a great guideline for suture removal. Uh, basically, I've always said, you know, the, fr the further you go away from the nose, the longer it's gonna take to heal. So obviously three to five days in the face, you go down to the back or the, or, or the extremities, could be as long as uh, 10 to 12 days. So good information for guidelines. Tetanus. Okay, we've talked, there's been changes in tetanus prophylaxis uh, many times over the years. It's really settled down now. About 50 cases a year of tetanus, uh, most often in the elderly and in the immunocompromised. So patients who have a clean wound um, with their last booster greater than five years should have a TD or a tetanus toxoid. Patients with a clean wound who have had a tetanus booster less than five years uh, usually require no further vaccination. Um, and patients who have not had at least three doses of the tetanus vaccine as a primary course should receive tetanus immune globulin and the TD or the tetanus toxoid and a schedule to complete their, their uh, primary vaccinations. Obviously patients with grossly contaminated wounds whose last tetanus booster was greater than five years um, also should get tetanus immune globulin and TD or tetanus toxoid. And uh, uh, the, T, the Tdap is, is now advised for all adults over age 19 at the time of their tetanus booster. So here's, here's a, a good graph uh, for, your, for your records in terms of prophylaxis and wound management. Uh, it's very valuable to have. And I think that's pretty well covering uh, the soft tissue injuries for today. Yeah, so thank you very much. That's my last lecture. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Have a great day.